please join me in welcoming Joseph Tex Dozier to the Pachyderm Cub Lectern. Let's make this height accurate for me. Thank you, uh, particularly to John for the invitation. As a fellow pachyderm who has enjoyed enlightenment and education at many of our lunches, it's an honor to hopefully contribute to the continuing chronicles today. This topic, 20 political trends for 2020, I apologize for the clickbait nature of the title, but you have to understand, just a few months ago, my partner, Professor Dozier, spoke on 30,000 years of economic history in 30 minutes. I have to attempt at least to compete while falling short with such a catchy topic. So let me present to you this enhanced uh, de facto BuzzFeed listicle. Owing to this week being Super Tuesday and owing to travel, I compiled these 20 in stream of consciousness. These are 20 developments of the many I consider daily in my work and my life. They are in no particular order. Some of them will entail a little bit more time than others that necessitate just a short broaching of the subject. Each of these could be a speech in their own right. And this isn't a typical speech in delivery form or structure. Consider this more of a brain dump, one that perhaps will challenge some of your views, make you better appreciate the business of politics, and put forward some topics you don't usually consider. First, to put context, the continual professionalization of campaigns. It's 64 BC. Eligible Roman men would soon vote for the Republic's next leader, their consul. The non-aristocratic orator and famous Republican Marcus Tullius Cicero, who came from nothing but a family business that cleaned togas, a laundry service, decided to run for office after building quite a reputation in lower down ballot, if you will, positions. After all, the dastard conspirator Catiline, who would later try to assassinate uh, Cicero and overthrow the Republic, uh, was running against him. So a lot was on the line. As a candidate, Cicero received, as a gift, the first treatise on how to win an election, with guidance from a source that anyone could appreciate, a younger sibling. In this case, Quintus Tullius Cicero. In short, Quintus lays out that a candidate must know how to schmooze, smear, and promise everything to everyone without becoming that distracted by the absolute certainty that he will fail meeting those promises. Quote from Quintus, after all, if a politician made only promises he was sure he could keep, he wouldn't have many friends. Quintus would proceed to advise his brother on juggling the commoners and the privilege, on flattery, which is, quote, disgraceful in ordinary life, but certainly has the uses on the campaign trail, and on the importance of gaining and exploiting opposition research, mainly against Catalan, while calling in all favors. Voter ingratiation, the choice of being loved or feared, certainly comes up centuries later in the treatise by Machiavelli, whichever side you fall on, fear or love, it's important to note that Machiavelli's tr pr treatise, while to a prince, is a reminder that governing is campaigning by other means. That hope for ingratiation and flattery finds home in campaigns throughout history, in sage advice and smart tactics by the candidates themselves. We certainly should respect our great founding father, George Washington. When he first ran for Virginia House of Burgess in 1758, he saw to it that the 391 voters received 160 gallons of rum, beer, and cider on election day. <laughs> Swilling the planters with bumbo, as they say, or the voice of the people was the voice of the grog. The first truly strategic and managed presidential campaign in U.S. history was McKinley's 1896 surprise election over the populist William Jennings Bryan, which smacked the Dems into oblivion until 1916 and really didn't relinquish Republican power until Roosevelt's election in 32. The business magnate and visionary Mark Hanna set forth an optimistic, inclusive campaign with strong funding, 250 million pieces of literature, swing state targeting, and a uniquely industrial in scale professional field operation that brought 750,000 people to McKinley's front porch in Canton, Ohio to hear prepared stump speeches that Hannah helped draft. Entering the 20th century, a benchmark for the political consulting class came in 1933 when married couple Clem Whitaker and Leon Baxter opened the first consulting firm in the U.S., Campaigns Inc., which elected many Republicans and famously defeated Truman's 1948 plan for a nationalized health care system. 
On the dim side, there's the infamous and beloved by many Joe Napolitan, a cigar-smoking, poker-playing, globe-trotting, quote, pioneer campaign consultant, as the New York Times would give him the honor of first receiving that job title publicly. He was a campaign genius who worked with legends like JFK and contributed much knowledge to my profession, a mentor beyond the grave. And here we come to the rise of the pop culture advisor, Carville and Stephanopoulos, who showed the first truly integrated campaign in modern history by, by getting rid of all the silos of campaigns and centralizing all operations out of their war room in Little Rock. Watch this documentary, even if you're a Republican, called War Room if you haven't. While there are certainly the unique cases like Carville who won their first campaign at 43 and only a short time later would find himself advising the governor of Arkansas and then retiring, there are certainly many more professional consultants working in niche regions, areas, and levels of government, often laboring behind the scenes, rarely if the story themselves, achieving victory for their clients, making a living. I'm a general consultant. I advise clients on strategy, messaging, and execution of integrated marketing campaigns. I glean from eclectic experience as well as broad knowledge in strategy, history, psychology, and advertising. Sometimes we specialize in deliverables like copywriting, telemarketing, and field projects. At the end of the day, the trend of the continualization of professionalized campaign, our job is to let a candidate be a candidate, allow a candidate to do what a candidate does best, raise money, meet voters. If you, the candidate, are worried about where your yard signs are, you're likely already losing. No, notably, and this is a bigger topic for another day, I believe the rise of the professional campaign consultant is directly proportional and positively correlated with the weakening influence of political parties in our country. From the, from the New York party machines, for example, Boss Platt, the Republican, and, a, and someone that I, whose uh, re readings you should uh, uh, read, and Tammany Hall's Boss Tweed to now. As Joe Napolitan was quoted, he practiced the art of communicating a candidate's message directly to the voter without filtering through the party organizations. As parties become weaker, campaigns become more sophisticated, and variables increase in marketing and media, the need for professionalization grows. Next, the changing digital landscape. In 2016, campaigns invested $1.5 billion into digital and proved that a candidate does not have to match or outspend an opponent in TV commercials. While the digital duopoly of Facebook and Google is certainly not over quite yet commercially, it still makes up 60% of all digital spending, the duopoly is over in politics. Just two months ago, Google stopped political marketers from targeting voters through its search, display, and YouTube ads. If all you're left with age, gender, and general location, that's not ideal for candidates with limited budget. The Google Display Network was critical for strategic persuasion of key voters. It's a travesty that the company has bowed to misguided public relations with a lazy solution to appear that they're seriously tackling this problem. The same for Twitter whose move was even more for public relations like Spotify because they received no money from political advertising. These self-regulatory changes won't cut down on disinformation, but rather limit campaigns and other operatives who are fighting against those efforts with facts. Up and coming, coming and first time candidates inspired to enter politics post Trump, whether Republicans wanting to help drain or Dems wanting to help retake are now handicapped on digital platforms. Micro-targeting on digital platforms has been a key tactic in helping challengers and budget-strapped campaigns remain competitive versus throwing money at television. Facebook and Zuckerberg, to their credit, has held on to allowing us to still target and still run political ads on their platform. I'm currently among a working group of consultants meeting and talking with Facebook executives on allowing advertising in the future while still combating fake news and bad actors. If Facebook could drop all political advertising, they would in a heartbeat. We are nothing to them in terms of their actual revenue. But the company has a dilemma. Exit the political ad business and, and get accused of torpedoing democracy, or remain and get accused of subverting democracy while having their costs go up. Zuckerberg currently believes principally that he can't exercise judgment over speech, even on a private platform like Facebook, as much as a headache that has been for him. Though he can have ad transparency and tracking. Asking Facebook to censor ads, puts too much power in the privileged few to judge what is true and what is false, and asking Facebook to ban political advertising only advantages incumbents. And I would like to say actually one other thing about this that's you're gonna find interesting. This is particularly paradoxically a threat to Democrats and the left whose elected officials are attacking Silicon Valley 
While platforms like pay Facebook provide first-time candidates and challenging candidates uh, the opportunity to break through, um, and we see this, I think the establishment Democrats most are most interested in this regulation because they're able to attack the right and the left at the same time, particularly the threat from the left. AOC, after all, put all of her money into Facebook micro-targeting by matching back all identified supporters with their emails to the platform, the very platform she wants to regulate now. So three, attention. We've now moved from an eighth grade reading level to fifth grade. Uh, we have an effective frequency required for increased repetitions for memory and our attention span is lower than a goldfish, which is nine seconds. <laughs> Moving next, targeting. Targeting, what is it, how it works. This, this term gets thrown around a lot. Um, basically what we're doing is we're looking at the voter file and lining it up against other demographic consumer data um, so that we can target the voters we actually want to reach to. Campaigns are exercises in limited resources, mainly time and money. And so especially in a primary or a low, low down ballot, you have to micro-target. You have to use voter data combined with web, consumer, and lifestyle data to send ads to particular demographic segments. Scott Brown's campaign a decade ago prioritizing 10% of his campaign budget to Google ads and search for college-educated women who drove a certain type of vehicle and watched the Food Network. Brad Parr scales millions in Facebook ads with A to Z run testing for Trump in 2016. Our firm discovering that the new first time Trump Republican voters in Tarrant County, making up 25 of the 25 percent of the electorate, were positively correlated to over 90 percent having hunting and fishing licenses and over 85 percent having a gun in their home. And then using that data to target hunting license holders against the voter file two months later for local elections. These are examples of micro targeting. Micro-targeting online is just a natural evolution of traditional messaging. It's ethical. Political advertisers have long aimed their messages at specific audiences, buying television ads on certain channels, uh, certain programs, or sending mailers to particular zip codes. We have a duty as professionals in, in politics to our clients to wisely spend their budgets. Micro-targeting is a must. Some campaigns are more contextualized and electorates are more ideal for micro-targeting versus others, but that's where the science and the art of the campaign professionalism comes in. One of my favorite examples of this cycle of micro-targeting came from Mayor Pete, who ran some ads featuring guided straight to camera videos where the supporter would on an app shoot the video themselves, being able, and then the campaign being able to immediately edit, manage, and brand all ads directly to supporters and persuadables at the local level. So let's say you shoot your video, your neighbors see the video within a few minutes. It's a pretty incredible thing. I see it and I saw the future. I met with the CEO last week. We're already using it for public affairs projects. This combination of authenticity, micro-targeting, and social pressure has so many potential uses and is the future. In 2012, 10% of political media spending was household targetable, aka addressable advertising, digital direct mail and telemarketing. By the 2016 presidential, addressable media blew up past 20%. The 2020 cycle, the future, will have us over 50%. Broadcasts and the non-targeted television and radio market shares are getting crushed, and their money's never coming back. Within a decade, broadcasts for political and public affairs will practically end with a whimper and not a bang. Polling, oh, it's the trend to knock it. But the death of polling has been greatly exaggerated. Often the issue, and this may not be popular, isn't that the poll is unreliable, but rather the person interpreting it, often the media, is unreliable. It's healthy to be skeptical and appreciate the science of polling. Be mindful of sampling. Be mindful of poll averaging. Understand margin of error, typically up to a 6% swing. And most importantly, question how the media reports polling. Often the media does these national polls and completely randomized polls of every citizen. These polls do not integrate the voter file and historic voter turnout. These polls are all hat and no cow. <laughs> Campaign polls rarely are reported on because they're internal for a reason and tactical for a reason. When they, these campaign polls are publicly leaked, there's a reason too. At the presidential campaign level in particular, where you must consider state by state polls, in some states like, think about 2016, Minnesota, no data, Wisconsin, crappy vendors, that's just the reality. And then you have the media putting out what is essentially these national preference polls. 
When the media hypes skewed polls and isn't skeptical, the lefty media wonderfully gets eggs on their face as they did election night 2016. Candidates should still be polling and committing at least 10% of their budget to research. Benchmark, brush fire, baseline polls, and tracking surveys are all tools campaigns and candidates must use. What's different now is the trend to recognize non-response bias, the Trump effect that happened in 2016. We shouldn't just rely on higher cost feedback from live call to landlines. And we shouldn't shift completely to the cheaper online polling. There's a reason landlines are fading away, and there's a reason polls that rely on them are not so accurate. So what we do instead is called unified sampling, because the person who answers a political call on a landline may look very different than the individual who ignores the call or can't even receive the call. Same goes for other modes of research. Just like campaigns have mixed media plans, we should have mixed polling plans. A multi-mode approach to polling. We must incorporate voter file validated text message, email, online surveying, of our phone poll alongside our phone polling. Sometimes we should put more weight on the live calls. If our model voter is a 70 year old, where 90% of households have landlines, but for the most part, landlines are the past. Next is mail. Another one that the direct death of has been greatly exaggerated. This is the old faithful in campaigns. As there's less competition in the mailbox today, this targeted deliverable is not going anywhere. In reality, it's increased use it's in reality, it has increased use. Targeted direct mail addresses the deficiencies that digital has in actual reach. The problem with digital reach. What we're seeing is more trust and more reading of direct mail now than ever before. And that's why there is more political direct mail now than ever before. One of the interesting things about this is how it cuts across demographic lines. What you see are folks now are, I believe the latest statistic from the USPS, they are now two times more likely. Yeah, two times, let me, get, let me actually see this. Yep, households are two times more likely now to read all the direct mail daily when they receive it than in 1987. And it's the majority of these households that are reading it. This cuts across all age and demographic groups. After the 2018 Virginia gubernatorial election, 70% of surveyed voters ranked direct mail among the three most legitimate sources of political news. TV came in at 50%, and I believe uh, phones came in, or phones and radio came in at around 30%. And what we also see is millennials are actually saying that they're reading their mail more than before in the past. This is the age bias isn't a factor. 90% of millennials deem direct mail to be reliable, 87% like getting information from retailers and campaigns in the mail, and 76% are somewhat likely to read their mail upon checking it. After all, millennials are receiving what in the mail anymore? They're not receiving their bills. They're getting them via email, so they actually don't mind checking the mail more and more. All right, peer-to-peer -peer texting. This is the, I know y'all probably already received some of these. This is the new thing, this is the great, the new big thing in the industry right now. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer texting is basically an outgrowth of outdated telecoms regulations. Right now, uh, it is illegal for any campaign to auto-dial any cell phones without opt-in. Similarly, no campaign, even under the First Amendment, can automatically send texts to you, even if they get your, your data, and know that you're a fellow Republican, they can't do that legally. Um, and so what we have to do instead is send individual text messages to individual voters from individual agents, aka peer-to-peer -peer texting. There are these new technology platforms that allow us to do that. But peer-to-peer -peer texting provides a more personalized, responsive, and qualitative communication tool that has an over 90% open rate, an over 80% open rate within three minutes, and it's something that you can check on your own time. Last cycle, recognizing an opportunity, we built a texting team realizing most of these tech startups would not have the human capital to meet the demand um, to actually send these individual texts. Um, we prioritized bringing on veterans, particularly disabled veterans who want to help us on our field campaigns but can't, and they still want to be involved in the political discussion and dialogue. And so we got them sending millions of texts, and the platforms allow them to send up to 2,500 individual texts personalized with their name, your name, and relevant messaging within an hour. And then in response, we're able to have very qualitative, high-level discussions with you as a voter. 
Peer-to-peer -peer texting is the most significant advancement in personalized political campaigning in a generation. The uses for polling, incorporating mail and rich media through MMS and constituent services are growing each day. And all of that is thanks to this platform, which also brings some good news along with the annoyance that you getting those texts this cycle might be. Robocalls, 5.7 billion sent last year. But facing a increasing regulation, call screening due to spoofing, and other factors, namely landlines now decreasing from, I believe, 80% in 1987 to, I believe, we're less than, let me see, yep, we're less than 40% of households have landlines today. This trend is certainly inversely propor proportional with cell phones, even for the octogenarians who have held on to their landlines. And so, as annoying as these peer-to-peer -peer texts are, they're the reason for the death of robocalls. So you're going to start seeing that phase out um, for other direct addressable personalized platforms like peer-to-peer -peer texting. And just like robocalls, peer-to-peer -peer texting is all about message and messenger and actually targeting a relevant voter. So as annoying as those messages can be, and we used to say robocalls didn't work as voters, they actually did work. Uh, because as long as we had the right message and the right messenger targeting the right person, we could cut through the noise. But now the medium's changed and we're on to peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer may die out and it may reach its height at this 2020 cycle. Maybe it'll be 2022. But that's the future right now. OTT. It's called Over the Top. While there will be plenty of traditional linear TV buys this cycle, ad dollars are finding homes in new channels, particularly OTT, Over the Top Streaming Services. Think of it like this, all video content, Roku, uh, Xboxes, Blu-ray players, anything that exists over the top or above the traditional cable box or satellite box. This also includes smart TVs. What we're seeing is that uh, I believe now over 50% of households are using OTT. So, and even we're seeing that 41% of individuals over the age of 80 are spending at least 21 minutes a day streaming on a smart TV or CTV over the top device. So you have both the elderly, your target voters often, as well as even millennials who are your cord cutters. So it's a very target rich environment for advertising. And I actually see in the future, um, we're going we're gonna to increase OTT spending up to $5.5 billion this year. That's a 100% increase. And I think it's going to go and just ha increase more and more each year. The, uh, the other interesting thing about OTT is that um, it doesn't allow us to scale right now with voter data, but what it does allow us to do is target folks or reach out to folks that we've already identified and help them get out to vote. And so that's what you're gonna see. And especially where Google Display Network now doesn't allow us political advertisers to put out videos on YouTube, you're gonna see some folks throwing money in to OTT in the future years. Money, Mark Hanna, the campaign boss mentioned earlier, quipped famously that there are two things that are important in politics. The first is money and the second, I can't remember. Money is a testament to candidate viability, popularity and trust. It's a tangible measurement of support. It's an actual buy-in from the voter for the candidate. Once you have that single dollar, you at least have that single vote. Without money, there is no successful campaign. With money, there can be an unsuccessful campaign. <laughs> money is overrated. In each race, at each level, based on context and electorate, there's a threshold, often high, but it's there to be competitive. There's a point of diminishing returns. With decently funded challengers going up against cash-heavy incumbents, I toast each time I see one of my incumbent opponents, more specifically their media consultants and advisors, taking them to the upcharge woodshed with broadcast buys, unnecessary sta staff salaries, and runaway collaterals, aka let's throw 40,000 into signs. Money is the blood of politics and campaigns with the most hemorrhage the most more often than not. Rick Perry, Jeb Bush, and many others before. And self-funders, they hemorrhage the most. The vast majority of self-funders missing out on all that critical moral and financial buy-in from supporters, lose. Two of the 32 self-funders in a recent congressional cycle that gave over 750,000 were the only that won. Studies show that one million in self-financing might buy you only five to 10% of the vote on election day. Mike Bloomberg is just the latest iteration. Instead of paying field rep salaries in excess of 7,000 a month, 
and essentially buying earned media with his money to remind everyone how much money he has, I imagine he might have been able just to buy American Samoa for over half a billion. <laughs> well, if only it was that easy. Oh. Filled, this is the gold standard. It's the GOAT, it's the greatest of all time. Nothing beats a door knock and a direct appeal, particularly from a social pressuring neighbor, a friend, or an extended hand from the candidate themselves. You knock, you win, that's a trend that's not changing. With today's technologies, targeted data, and additional psychological research into deep persuasion, Phil continues to be integral to all political campaigns. While campaigns have ditched paper lists almost a decade ago, and no longer need to go down to county elections or count the county party for data, the future is even more exciting. Technologies and augmented reality is coming where our professional canvassers will wear wearables like normal glasses or contact lenses with heads-up displays that record their interactions, provide all of the relevant voter data, and immediately overlays the voter house file with the interaction at the door. We're only about a decade away from that. By the way, there's pick on me, pick on the left. That's me as a first, that's, that's baby beard me as a first timer, uh, helping a first timer canvas in Texas. And on the right, still doing field. This is recently in North Carolina where we had the special congressional and we did GOTV with a bunch of young Republicans. And whenever you see Dan Bishop win by just a couple of points, that's where you know field often just saves the day. Hacking, the trend of election hacking. It's gonna continue without election administrators and bodies taking proactive steps to enhance their cybersecurity auditing processes and getting rid of antiquated equipment. Russian-backed hack attempts were made on the election-related networks in 20 states in 2016, for example. We're talking malware on voter registration databases, uh, entire voter registration databases stolen, private vendors of e-poll books compromised. The current U.S. election system, the current election system used in the U.S. provides no end-to-end -end encryption or auditability. There's no way often to prove that the votes were or were not changed. Sorry to level with you, I'm just gonna say how it is. And while our decentralized systems of locally administered elections, it has its merits. We can never be hacked nationally with a national central election commission. The decentralized system, particularly for presidentials in a game of margins and the electoral college, could come down to hacking a single county or executing a denial service attack to a single precinct. These days, a county election administrator in the middle of America is on the front lines of national security. We have an election infrastructure crisis in the US. Across the country, you will find the use of DRE, direct recording electronic, or optical scans, paper ballots being scanned into a machine as a JPEG. These have been used since 1974, with the bulk of the more recent ones being purchased two decades ago. These are expensive systems with an iceberg of a life cycle cost. The tip being just the acquisition. Many systems aren't federally certified, these are standards written before the first iPhone, still run on Windows XP, and over 40 states can't buy replacement parts or in bidding wars on eBay to strip down old machines to be able to keep theirs running. There's potential hacking galore without knowing the better. Examples include reprogramming major US machine vendors to play Pac-Man, a security firm hacking all of Maryland's Diebold machines that cost them $55 million within 10 seconds, and Princeton students realizing that all you need is a Pringles can to use an antenna to extend your range a half mile from any Virginia polling site using WinVote machines so that you can hack into its WEP wireless network with the unchangeable key of ABCDE and change votes without any record trial. Electronic voting systems operate on a proprietary vendor closed source code from third party companies who all count this vote in secret. You hack the wall to the fort, you can take out a single soldier or the entire army, and no one would know. Unlike the centralized, closed-ended, black box databases, there is a future and potential use for blockchain in our elections as a decentralized, open-source, peer-to-peer network to allow no tampering. It's a linear log of data entries recording a history of transactions. I know it's, like, it's very wonky, but if you're interested, you can read more. Think about a jigsaw puzzle. Very hard to put together, but very easy to see if a piece is out of place. But for now, at the very least, print on demand paper balloting with optical scanning. Instead of it just being a JPEG, we also have the paper ballot taking place at voting centers. That's what needs to happen, and that's what's happening. That's why more counties are moving to 100% print on demand, and it's critical to have that paper backup. 
past is prologue. First, we're going to talk about the 2016 election. As Vanderbilt political science professor Larry Bartels has studied, 2016, it wasn't an abnormality. And any attempt to explain what happened as unique is a cover-up of ineptness. See Hillary Clinton's What Happened, or Cry Me a River, for, as the subtitle said. 2016 was a continuation of recent campaign, of recent presidential campaigns across all demographic trends for turnout from gender, race, to religion. For example, liberals like to say 2016 was a so-called white, white nationalism election. But 57% of white voters chose Trump in 2016. In 2012, 59% of white voters chose the Republican. In 2008, 55%. In 2004, 58%. Most people who voted in 2016 chose the same party in 2012. The only new electoral trend is that white working class votes now more or less vote like a minority bloc. Moreover, seven of the last eight nominees who have tried to run for the same party have lost. If anything, a Hillary Clinton presidency, a victory for the Democrats, would have been more historically unprecedented than just electing the first woman. It would be overcoming the challenge of trying to re re repeat the results of a re-election campaign without any advantage of incumbency. Similarly, 2020, speaking of incumbency, incumbent presidents have won 14 of the 19 re-election bids since 1900, and that's all we need to say about that. As far as the Dems, I'm just waiting to see how 2016 super delicate compromise, super delicate compromise comes back to make the butt hurt Bernie bros burn down the place. Oh yeah, look at them. Because what happens at the second round at the convention, all the super delegates are let loose at the second round. So be on the lookout for that if Bernie takes it to the convention. Dirty dim politics, uh, dirty dim, oh, dirty dim politics. I'm sorry, that was a Freudian slip. Dirty dim de demographics. Demographics have a dem uh, Democrats have a demographic inefficiency problem. They are becoming far too clustered in urban centers to be effective. The blue dog Democrat, it's extinct. There are only, there are only mega cities in the US, these mega cities in the US inefficiently distribute votes for the Democrats in already blue states. The mega city states of Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Florida have enough rural areas and small cities that cast enough votes to outvote the mega ci cities. That's why they're swing states. The place where the Democratic coalition is growing the most does them the least good. The Democrat party is shifting to becoming urban and urbane and it's causing them headaches with more than just the electoral college. Because there's no amount of gerrymandering that can save them in the House, state legislatures, and especially in the US, U.S. Senate. Consider this, Mitt Romney lost the presidency by about four points, but still carried 24 states. John Kerry lost by only 2.5 points and carried just 19 states. The Senate, barring context of a scandal or celebrity Democrat candidates, is a natural gerrymander for Republicans, and I hope it remains. Polarization. Oh, it's the big trend. We are more supposedly polarized now than ever before. It's a continual trend claimed by the media and many. But we always think current history is the best or worst without any context to the past. Hamiltonians, Jeffersonians, they were, they were dueling with each other with, and actually dueling with each other and clashing in rhetoric and threats as President Washington decided not to run for another term while facing poor health and declining memory. Washington's famous warning against parties in his farewell address is often echoed today. But maybe this is controversial, but it's the truth. We should remember that Washington was saying this warning as a Federalist himself, as the leader of a de facto single party, trying to prevent the rise of competing party in the Jefferson-led Republicans. Washington had sided with Hamilton, which had led Jefferson to resign. Washington's words about a spirit of revenge taking over governing for the good of the people was not out of consciousness, but actually out of control. Politics isn't about governing for the good of people. Politics is about achieving, achieving the good of people is a consequence about politics. Politics about, is about adjudication of power. And in some parts of the world, politics is conducted at the end of a gun barrel. And that's why winning is so important. Violence is the greatest consequence of polarization, and our country has been duly polarized, and our lands duly drenched in the threat and blood of violence owing to past polarization. Let's listen directly from the... John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. 
If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. Actual campaign rhetoric used in the election of 1800. Yale historian Joanne Freeman's, Freeman's eye-opening book, The Field of Blood, enlightens that between 1830 and 1860, there were more than 70 violent incidents between congressmen in the House and the Senate, in chambers, or in the surrounding area. And that's just what everyone reported and publicly actually said happened. We have the notable caning of Charles Sumner by Preston Books after Sumner's crimes against, Crime Against Kansas speech, which includes, included personal attacks against Brooks' brother. Interestingly, while these party diversion disputes over race and slavery in the mid-1800s brought about such violent polarization, it would be inter-party compromise to, stat to become the status quo in the mid-1900s after World War II around race that brought this unique period of bipartisanship and lack of polarization that we often reference nostalgically. America had a de facto multi-party system in the mid-1900s. Southern Dems and Northern Dems formed distinct coalitions operating within a party that didn't draw cultural lines, but blurred them. People felt that political parties weren't responsible, but that they weren't putting forth defined agendas in the mid-1900s so that people could make a choice between them. American politics functioned on compromise to allow racial white supremacy to exist in the South in the mid-1900s. The Civil Rights Act started the realignment on racial lines. The problem of polarization's absence in the mid-1900s reached its symbolic zenith in the 1950 academic paper from the American Political Science Association titled, The Need for Greater Party Responsibility. Leading political scientists lamented that, that there wasn't enough polarization that there was a pressing emergency for a functioning two-party system with proper opposition instead of two loosely, loose confederations of states and local parties with no discernible policy differences. Polarization is often a lazy word for disagreements we have that come to the surface. The reality is our governmental system is designed to gridlock when such disagreements come to the surface. Gridlock is not necessarily bad at the federal level. Winning a single election might not mean you can even govern, but is that the worst thing? Our idiosyncratic American political system demands compromise and often only can find that compromise in times of great crisis at the federal level, at the national level. But also, it's notable, I think people prefer the problems of paralysis than the problems of government. We must build our understanding of polarization on current baselines and not on some historical nostalgia. The alternative to polarization is often suppression. Polarization is not bad. What is different with today's polarization is not faction or fracture, but how these different fra fractures, cultural, racial, religious, align on top of each other. And we now have all-encompassing mega identities with our polarization. That's the difference in the trend. Democracy in decline. Um, we, are sad we are sadly in the 14th year of declining global freedom based on the Freedom House Index. One third of the world, more than 2.5 billion, live in a declining democracy and live under what's called autocratization. The overall losses to democracy are still shallow compared to the gains in the 20th century, but the pattern is consistent and it's ominous. Democracy is in retreat. A crisis in confidence in many of these societies has intensified, where many don't believe democracy serves their interests. Of the 41 countries that were consistently ranked free by the Freedom House Index from 1985 to 2005, 22 have registered net score declines in the last five years. Elections are being hollowed out as autocrats find ways to control the results while sustaining a veneer of competitive balloting. Polls in which the outcome is shaped by coercion, fraud, manipulation, gerrymandering are increasingly common. As I've seen personally, democratic dictators do exist and they boldly and transparently act out their fraud. Election interference an often trumped up term by the media without much context or appreciation. Carnegie Mellon has conducted a study of elections from 1946 to the current day and determined that 11% of elections around the world had foreign influence. I actually believe this number is higher than 25%, but that's just what they could find from publicly, publicly available and research data. Um, and, and this was just inference by Russia and the US, but what they found was 70% of the time it was the US rather than Russia. 
Uh, this interference goes back. I'm, here, I'm about to say, I, I'll say it how it is, and I might be controversial here. This interference goes back to the days of Eisenhower's blessing of the CIA's Special Activities Division Political Action Group when it waged a Madison Avenue styled ad war in Italy to win the election against the communists to help the Christian Democrats. The U.S. pumped in about $20 million for campaigning, posters, and literature, along with a 10 million letter writing campaign and a focus on short rave radio. Heck, they got Time Magazine to put the head of the Christian Democrats on the cover. On the other side, the Soviets were pumping in 10 million a month towards the Communist Party's effort. The agency would engage in every Italian election for the next 24 years, and a leftist coalition would not win in Italy until 1996. Election interference takes different forms these days, but it still continues as a trend. The reality is this. Countries and corporations influence foreign elections, acting very rationally and understandably in defense of their values and in offense of their interests while skirting a line of international law and diplomacy. And that's not a bad thing. As long as we are the ones defending liberty and advancing our ally alliances and our interests. And that's my hot take on that. I'm sorry, that's controversial. Weaponized web. In 2010, Stux, Stuxnet um, was the U.S.-Israeli takedown of Iran's nuclear program with a USB containing a virus that shut down centri centrifuges. It showed that the world could have a digital weapon that could alter and destroy physical infrastructure of a foreign power. Fast forward, we've now come to accept a new world of hacking viruses and information streams that influence, and influence us in unprecedented ways and will continue to do so with the onset of augmented reality. We hand over our information, including our votes, to third parties overseeing the centralized databases referenced before that give thieves complete ownership once hacked to not one but all of our records. The weaponized web has presented another battlefield for geopolitical interference. As Russia can't compete with the U.S. militarily, technologically, or economically, it now has accepted its Chief of Staff General Valery Gerasimov's recommendations, known as the Gerasimov Doctrine. It, that blurs the line between war, war and peace, that the best strategy is to fight a war with soft power, as the U.S. did against the Soviets. They've learned from us, and now they're taking cyber warfare against us. The ROI on such has been incredible in the digital and electoral realms. They know how our media works. The, electoral, the U.S. electoral system is the heart of the world's most powerful republic. Because, but now, because of a little money Russia spent and some hacking, Americans became locked in a national argument over campaign legitimacy. We're at war with ourselves and our enemy didn't even fire a physical shot. The threats of the weaponized web extend to geopolitical examples in Latin America, where Andres Sepulveda, he spent years hacking elections, perpetuating black propaganda, and hacking democracies to the highest bidder. Very famous, if you want to look him up, Sepulveda. North Korea, the government's reconnaissance general bureau, its main intelligence branch, executes cybercrime operations at a scale that serves as a primary source of government revenue. It's now in the billions, and it funds its nuclear weapons program. China has copper, comprehend, I said that like Trump, China. <laughs> China has comprehensively composed a database of its American adversary by hacking the U.S. Office of Personnel, Marriott Hotels, Anthem, Equifax, and others. They have a full profile on all of us. A victory on the battlefield of this cyber war is institutional insecurity, the potential for information warfare to create a confusing environment where nobody is sure of anybody's motives and can't trust institutions. That is the Gerasimov doctrine in practice. That is the weaponized web. Deep fakes. In the past, in a past Kenyan election, opposition candidate Raya Odinga was discredited in his campaign because of a forged memorandum of understanding that he allegedly signed with Muslim leaders that he would put in Sharia law. Now, imagine, now, and that was just based on a signature. Now, a forged signature. Imagine if there was a video of Odinga on election day saying that. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. I owe it all to Spectre. Spectre showed me that whoever controls the data controls the future. I wish I could tell you that we're going to be able to stop all interference. But this that is just a deep fake. What you watched at the beginning was There fake. will always be bad actors in the world, and we can't prevent all governments from all interference. But even without our employees directly involved in the sales, 
We imagine this for a second. And there's the original compared to the new one. So this is that's an example of a deep fake technology. It's an improving tool of the weaponized web, and it's getting better by the day. The deep fake, which is using an existing image or media manipulated by machine learning and AI, it's an alarming trend that must be addressed and combated. And as much as I appreciate its satirical use, I think it's pretty easy for us to see the threat to stability and safety in that what we see in reality, what we see with our eyes has been the last bastion for truth. And suddenly we realize how do we, how do we verify this continuous stream of data and content that we consume each day and assume it's accurate. And finally, the greatest trend of all times. <laughs> Signs still don't vote, guys. Signage use has quintupled quintupled in the last three decades. Every time a good candidate with an excess of yard signs loses by a thin margin, a political consultant dies. It's actually a fact. The randomized field experiments that presented signs in the most light only show them maybe doing a 1% in positive increase with a margin of error of 0.7%. I'm not gonna take that. So signs are a, a thief of time, treasure, and talent. View them as glorified gifts to supporters. And that's how the national campaigns treat them by setting up uh, white label websites where you can actually buy your signs. There's so much other items and addressable media that you can use. These are personal identity expressions of solidarity and defiance to one's neighbor. That's what a yard sign is. <laughs> I'm just going to say, this is, I'm just going to say, they are demonstrative, not persuasive. Have candidates ever here, here noticed that you don't have enough signs? or that your sign isn't where an opponent's is, and have you noticed that the person telling you that is already a supporter? <laughs> the people who notice signs are your supporters and your opponents. Please, please ditch them. But probably coming to, in closing, the greatest trend of all time is probably this, that even though signs still don't, signs still don't vote, a voter might not show up because of a sign in the yard, a voter might not show up because they got a peer-to-peer -peer text, and a voter might not show up because a well-funded candidate. At the end of the day, the greatest get out the vote tool is a reason. If I had to choose between having, as Obama's campaign, the greatest data and digital operation or video of Mitt Romney's 47% comment, I'd choose the 47% comment. Because as a mentor said, moral indignation is the most powerful motivating force and likely trend in politics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a lot of questions. We're short on time, so I've got. I'm happy. I'm happy to stay a few minutes late, and if people need to duck out, I won't take it personal. It's totally yeah, fine. That's exactly my point. I'm going to hand this over to Joseph. Uh, club members get priority. Question. Okay. Thank you. Please keep your questions short and concise, and uh, we'll start right here. Yeah, your comment on signs mm -hmm. on with the fake C2 organization and should we we've got a lot of signs out but is that something perhaps we should not spend as much money on this is nonpartisan. it's just getting public awareness um, is that a good way to do it well, I, I don't know all the specifics of what your budget is, but what I always say is you, can, you should have signs as, and especially in this case, as a petition campaign. I mentioned their gifts to supporters. Who asked that so I can actually address it? Uh, their gifts to supporters. So if they make a supporter feel more committed to the movement, more likely to go canvas for you and get more signatures, I understand that. But if you have a limited budget and you're spending 100% on signs, yeah, you, you, want to, you want that to be as small of a portion of the budget as possible. I would rather any campaign invest more of that on, hey, we have a voter file of which attend voters and we want to do some digital ads or go knock some doors. Um, that's what I always recommend. But there's their gifts. Let your supporters have them. Make your supporters happy. Thanks. So what is your sense as to how the RNC is doing this election cycle uh, across all platforms, uh, particularly electronic uh, media versus the DNC. I think we had lost some ground to him in the past. Are you spe specifically thinking about digital or email? What are you? Right. Okay. I, I actually think the, the RNC and all the party committees are out fundraising the Dems. Um, and they're using pretty effective use or probably, I, I think it's almost a diminishing return on how many emails and texts they're sending. So where, 
where the, the committees are not pulling their weight, you know who is pulling his weight? Brad Parskell. And Parskell was the first to spend, um, oh, I think he had like over 250 million, I mean, something crazy on digital last cycle. And he plans to spend um, up to a billion on the campaign. So the Trump campaign is going to carry a lot of weight online. And, um, and we just have to adjust with the reality. Oh, and, and I got to say, that, remember I mentioned this actually, the digital regulations, they hurt the Dems more. Because imagine this, if I'm a Democrat presidential candidate and Facebook restricts all political advertising, Trump was able to build his like base with paid advertising. So if I'm a dim coming into this cycle, I'm going to face that challenge if they're just already because of Google and Twitter getting rid of political advertising and Facebook now has additional ad requirements. So I think the dims are actually at a disadvantage compared to the Republicans this cycle digitally because of that. Well, I'm going to wrap this up with the last question. You mentioned blockchain technology. George Gilder has a new book out on it saying that this is going to move us past the uh, Google and uh, a current digital platform. Could you expand on where the strengths of blockchain and does it solve some of the problems, and particularly in terms of election security uh, that we have going forward? Sure. So when I was describing our current system, similar to banks, is is closed source. It means a vendor has like proprietary machine or software that only they have the trade secrets to actually verify and audit and get approvals and, and make changes to. So the voter cannot actually ever be able to personally audit the election. Blockchain is essentially, think about um, an open actual chain, literal chain of transactions, allows any, and they're anonymized transactions, allows anyone to actually see if there's any manipulation on that. It's open source, uh, and so it's, it's, I know it's a very complicated topic, but what, the way I explained it as before, think of a jigsaw puzzle. It's very hard to put together, but it's easy to see if it's a part. Ways that we can use this in voting, real world ways, and it has been used in some primary elections. It's being used in Poland and Estonia, owing to the threats of Russia in uh, taking down their electronic voting systems. Um, ways we can use it in the states and some of the counties may eventually experiment with is when you go to your voting center, you essentially get uh, your, a QR code that is your, your key uh, to vote on the blockchain. And so you, we could still make it seem like you're voting as you're used to. You're going to go into the booth, but you're going to use this key and scan it and cast your vote. But you'll be able to see immediately that your vote was cast and it's not, that, that, that there was a recording of your key's vote at that time. And so that's great, that record's there. Um, and why I think we're gonna first come go to 100% paper ballots, but you start hearing these issues of long lines, like in Texas, uh, those are completely gotten rid of when you have blockchain technology. And there's a reason the financial services sector and trade, uh, major international trade is going more and more to blockchain. And even our digital ad buying, because there's a lot of ad fraud in digital ad buying, a lot of bots who just, you know, if you're paying for impressions, they're just throwing it out there. If we're able to b buy on a blockchain technology, we can guarantee to the client that 100% of the ad spend is going to where they want to and it's not, we're not uh, committing ad fraud against them. So it's opening the doors. Government can't hack it. Corporations can't control it. And people can see it. It's beautiful. Thank you. Joseph, thanks, Coach.